Thank you for that lovely introduction. And it is uh, wonderful to be here in Bratislava. I've, I've had a, a, a very enjoyable uh, five days uh, here. And, um, uh, and I'm looking forward to speaking to you. Uh, please do forgive me for speaking in English. Um, and if, um, if I speak too fast, please put your hand up and say, for goodness sake, slow down. Um, but um, I, I, I'm going to, uh, yes, talk about this. I'll, I'll explain a little bit. I, I, I said to, to Gabrielle, oh, I can give you a talk on, I'm doing some methodology work analyzing films. And I was thinking, I have a, I have a talk. I, I, I've written that talk. I can do that talk. And he said, oh, yeah, that's nice. That's interesting. Um, could you, though, do something a little bit more like this? And I, and I got lured in and I thought, yeah, well, yes, maybe he's right. And I proposed another topic. I said, I've done some work on sort of process thinking. Would that be of interest? He said, look, why don't you just do something a bit bold, a bit Nietzschean, like, is psychology dead? So I, I, I rose to the challenge. I thought this was a very interesting provocation. Um, but it means I didn't have a talk called, is psychology dead? But I, as, 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 but I do have one now, I think. I think I've managed to put together a plausible narrative around this theme. So is psychology dead? So I'm sure you're familiar the, the, with, with the, the origin of this quote, which is Friedrich Nietzsche, who didn't say, is psychology dead? He said, God is dead and we killed him. And, and so there's this dramatic philosophical intervention. And of course, Nietzsche also considered himself to be the first psychologist and was bold enough to say he's the psychologist of the future. Um, which isn't to say that this presentation is Nietzschean. I think Nietzsche is slightly problematic character as well. We shouldn't be embracing pure Nietzscheanism. I think that would not be uh, necessarily helpful. But let me begin by saying that, well, of course, psychology is not dead. Psychology, you could say, is more alive than it ever has been. It's probably the most popular discipline in many countries. We now educate probably more psychologists than people in any other disciplines. In the UK, I think it's getting close to being the most popular undergraduate discipline. And we also teach it before degree level. So there's a huge amount of interest in psychology. Um, we're all interested in psychology, just as Nietzsche was when he wanted to be the future psychologist. And also there's a growing army of psychologists, ever more popular, ever more involved in every aspect of society, educational psychologists, transport psychologists, media psychologists, and so on. So on one level, of course, no, of course, psychology is not dead. It's thriving. Um, but you can also have something that thrives, even if it's not necessarily alive. Thriving doesn't necessarily mean living. So we would have to qualify a little bit. What do we mean if psychology is dead? What does it mean for it to be alive? So uh, uh, it's quite interesting that actually in the physical sciences, it's very hard to make a decision about what it is that counts as something being alive. So I put this quotation from the quantum physicist um, Erwin Schrodinger, who wrote a book called What is Life in the, in, the, in the 60s, I think. And he says, well, there's an obvious inability of present day physics and chemistry to account for the events in time and space which take place within the spatial boundary of a living organism. So this is one of our top physicists saying, well, we don't really know what life is. And we've recently had this sort of pandemic experience where we've been locked down thanks to a virus. And if you look at the scientific literature, I think the verdict is out. It's unclear whether a virus lives or doesn't live, whether it's something, whether it's an organism or it's not an organism. It's something on the edge between something living and something not living. And also you can have brain dead states, the vegetative state, if you're unfortunate enough to have an accident and you, you, you are uh, left in a, in, in a condition of being brain dead, 
you're alive organically, but you're brain dead. So the idea of life and death is, becomes more complicated. So is there a sense that psychology might be in a vegetative state or in a viral state where it's taking over the world, but in a sort of unthinking viral kind of way? Well, that's what I want to sort of s at least have us think about. And I, I, I have a, my preferred argument is, well, that's probably too extreme. It's useful to entertain these extreme ideas, but, but to the extent it's true, I think it's, it's true because psychology has neglected its core subject matter. And this is something that Gabrielle has emphasized in this recent book, Figurations of Human Subjectivity, this word subjectivity. Um, psychology, in an interesting way, has turned its back on the question of subjectivity. And maybe what gives psychology life is its capacity to engage something like subjectivity. And, to, and so, so that my, my theme is that, yes, psychology is to some extent in a, in a, in a, in a sort of dead state, but that we can re-energize it if we reflect upon the relevance of subjectivity. So um, that's basically the message, so I'll just say a few more things to, uh, to flesh that out. Um, so, um, so I'm going to urge the continuing relevance of subjectivity of psychology is to be reborn. I'm going to briefly introduce the idea of a second order psychology. This is an idea that Steve Brown and I developed in one of those books going around, Psychology Without Foundation, and that Gabrielle has developed in his book as well. Um, and I want to show that if we take seriously the idea of a second order psychology, which is basically a kind of psychology of psychology, I'll explain that a little bit, then in a sense, it becomes important to also, as psychologists, engage in the history of psychology. We have to understand the history of our discipline is actually constituting the present questions. So psychology has to become a kind of historical discipline if it's to take seriously um, subjectivity. So it becomes crucial for us to, 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 to engage with the history of our discipline. And that's quite difficult because we tend to think of the history of our discipline as kind of irrelevant. That's for historians. That's dusty tomes, du dusty books on a, on a shelf that are not, of no interest to modern science. But, no, oh, I think it is. And to um, help with this argument, I'm going to introduce a very simple distinction that... Uh, is a thread running through the book that's being circulated here, um, Putting Psychology in its, in its Place, which is the book that I've written with my colleague Graham Richards. And we introduce a, a simple distinction between psychology with a big P, which is psychology the discipline, and psychology with a small P, which is psychology the subject matter. So the discipline is what it is that professional psychologists do, our publications, our experiments, and so on. The subject matter is things like our emotions, our memory, our, our cognitive processes, our thoughts, our language capacities. Um, and the, the point of making this distinction between big P and little p is not to keep them apart, but to recognize that actually they're influencing one another. So the kinds of theories that we come up with as psychologists are actually changing the subject matter of us ordinary people. Um, and vice versa, psychology, the little p, is what allows us to do psychology. I'll, 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 exp I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit shortly. But first, psychology is dead and we have killed it. So this is the <laughs> continuing Nietzsche theme. Um, well, probably you've come across this idea of the death of the subject. It's very French. It's very associated with post-structuralism, uh, with the death of the author in literary theory, for example, and Roland Barthes. But it's not just associated with 
the postmodern turn, which has had a big influence in psychology and which I, I like to think of myself as being a part of to some degree, whereby we start to recognize that human subjectivity is to a large extent constructed in talk, in discourse, in conversations. Um, but it's not just to do with postmodernism. You could also say that the subject was also killed by positivism. Positivism being the sort of idea of science that assumes the quantifiability, measurability of physical properties as the basis of the philosophy of science that psychology needs to adopt. So there's two ways in which, psychology, in which subjectivity was killed or died. It was killed by positivism. So a good example would be early behaviorism, Watson, for example, in, in psychology, who decides that, well, we can't study subjectivity because we can't access it. So what we can study is behavior because we can see it, we can measure it, we can act on it. And that then moved towards, well, that means there is no such thing as subjectivity. So all there is is behavior. So, so, so um, in a sense, the, 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 the subject is killed twice, once by positivism and then if there was anything left by literary theory and postmodernism. Um, now, but I want to take stock and, and you know, there's going to be very little psychology in this talk. <laughs> I want to take stock and zoom back a little bit. When we talk about the death of the subject, well, what is this subject thing? It's a funny concept, isn't it? But if we step back a little bit and look at things in historical perspective and take into account philosophy and so on, we observe that modern philosophy itself was born with the invention of this thing called the subject. So the idea of what would be called by big German philosopher Immanuel Kant, the transcendental subject, became the absolute foundation of all knowledge and all philosophy. But before Kant, you had Descartes, René Descartes, the French philosopher, who's usually credited with being the founder of modern European philosophy. And his founding gesture is, I think, therefore, I am. This radical positing of subjectivity as the starting point of any knowing process. So there's this huge elevation of the relevance of the subject, of subjectivity. And I say elevation because this is the transcendental subject. It's not something that is, if you like, studyable by psychologists. In fact, Immanuel Kant made a big point of saying psychologists cannot study the transcendental subject. It can't be studied. It's like the eye looking at itself. The eye can't look at itself. It, 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 so it, it, that belongs to philosophy. That's something that is excluded from the terrain of, of psychology for Kant. And then, so, so, so this is why it becomes such a significant question, this, this question of the death of the subject, because the subject was born as a transcendental subject, as the foundation of the whole way in which we were thinking as modern um, as modern society. And when I say modern, I'm talking about the 17th century, um, when, when modern philosophy was born. Um, and if you look at um, is a, another influential figure called Francis Bacon, who wrote a book called The Novum Organum, The New Organon, in 1620. Um, and this was, again, talking about the need to really reflect upon the human subject and our ways of knowing before we can actually ever begin to understand the world outside of us. So, so modern philosophy is born with this transcendental subject, and so its death is something significant. And we need to understand the emergence of the history of psychology in the context of the crisis of these ways of organizing knowledge. Now, let me explain a little bit what I mean. What we get in, in the modern period with people like Descartes is an absolute separation, a split between 
object, which is to do with matter, and subject, which is to do with meaning. And so for Descartes, these things are seen as two substances, he would call them, two absolutely independent substances. And in fact, what a substance is, is something that is completely dependent only on itself for what it is. It's completely isolated from other things. So matter is one isolated thing, and that's for the physicists, for Newton and so on to describe. And then the subject, meaning, that's also something transcendental, something depending only on itself and ultimately traceable to something theological, ultimately given to us by something um, transcendent. So um, Bacon basically says we need a fresh start for the labour of mind and we need to watch out for three vain idols. There's the sophistic, they're the people who just get too stuck in elaborate rational arguments and so they ignore empirical findings. There's the empiric, they do look at empirical findings, but they only look at a small subset and so they have a very biased way of understanding the world and they, they don't reason enough. And then there's the superstitious, the superstitious who are swayed by um, uh, their, their, their theological beliefs. So, um, in a sense, you can see a proto-psychology here. The idea is that, you know, you can imagine this to be a modern psychological Form. You need to critique your ways of thinking. You need to make sure that you have a methodology that means you're not sophistic, you're not empiric, you're not superstitious. And so then you can remove the clouds that stop you seeing matter as it is. Okay? And you're going to like this. <laughs> this is... Uh, an, uh, uh, my depiction of an essay that this big German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, wrote in, I think, uh, 1798. And it's called The Conflict of the Philosophy Faculty with the Theology Faculty. Um, what I want to sort of illustrate is that these ideas about the separation between the subject and the object are institutionalized in buildings, in universities and so on. So Kant was laying out the blueprint for a reforming of the modern university, just as Germany was emerging as a power and the German university system was going to become, you know, the, the envied system of the world. And what he's observing here is basically the structure of the university from medieval times. Um, and so medieval universities, up until the time that Kant was writing, had basically four faculties. They had a faculty of theology, a faculty of law, and a faculty of medicine. And those were considered the higher faculties. And I've drawn this little blue line here. This is, anything here is inside the university. Anything here is outside the university. So what's going on in the university is you're training in your theology faculty, the clergy to go out into the world and then to spread their goodness into the world. In law, you're training magistrates. They're gonna go out into the world and do their thing in the world. In medicine, you're training physicians and they're going out into the world. So you've got inside the university the incorporated scholars, the theologians, the lawyers and so on, and outside of the system you're producing the intelligentsia. So the intelligentsia are the clergy, the magistrates, the physicians and so on. And Kant says, well, these are the higher faculty because government has an interest in controlling these aspects of human behavior. So the clergy are concerned with the human spirit and making sure that people are sort of existentially correct, are thinking the right way in terms of their spiritual life. Magistrates and law are controlling civic society, so the norms of our conduct, of our behavior, are being governed by law. And physicians are controlling our bodily life, so our, our illnesses and so on are going to be controlled by medicine. 
So you have the, the bodily aspect of the human condition, the social aspect of the human condition, and the spiritual aspect of the human condition. And they're all neatly associated with a sphere. And then there's a faculty for each of them in the university. And then there's the faculty of philosophy underneath it, which deals with um, knowledge and is divided into the historical components, which deal with the natural sciences, for example, and mathematics, metaphysics, and what's the third M? I've forgotten. <laughs> uh, there's a third M. Um, and what Kant wanted to argue is that actually the philosophy faculty needs to take over from the theology faculty as a higher faculty. The philosophy faculty should be the higher, precisely because it's philosophy and the mediation of knowledge that can be used to help society to govern people in terms of their body, their society and their soul, their spiritual aspects. So this was for Kant, the, this, this is the Kantian settlement. And the point is to, is to say that this philosophy isn't sort of innocent. This philosophy is informing the organization of knowledge, the division of institutions into different faculties, into different departments, with each with their chair and their professor and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing to observe about this is there is no place for psychology in this. And theoretically, Kant rules out, as I say, the possibility of psychology. There's the transcendental subject. Our subjectivity is just something elevated that belongs ultimately to a space that we can't interrogate. And the emergence of psychology, I, I try to argue in this book with Graham, is associated with the collapse of this Kantian settlement. So I use the word settlement to say it organizes things. It's what Bacon called an organon. So an organon is ultimately a book. But there were two types of book. There was the canon, and the canon book is the indisputable book. So governance, governance wants to know what the canon is. Okay? So there's a canon of theology. And we know what the book is in theology. All right? There's a canon in law, which is the indisputables of law. And there's a canon for medicine. And then, in a sense, the, the theology, the theologians and the lawyers and the medicines, they debate the canon. They write books about the book, but they don't think that they're producing a canon. They're, they're introducing the canon to people during their education. They're debating the canon. So books play a key role in this organon. And indeed, the, the, the canon is distinguished from the organon. So when Bacon talks about a new organon, he's talking about a new way of thinking about the authoritative book that is going to be organizing the way in which we uh, govern in society. So, um, and Kant was worried that the canon was losing its plausibility. There was no longer a confidence that you could rely upon the canon of law, the canon of theology, or the canon of medicine. There was a need to transfer it all into philosophy and the sciences. And very quickly, the sciences began to individuate from the philosophy faculty and acquire increasing power. So there's a, there's a, this is the story that I want to tell about the, the mystery of why psychology seemed to arise as a, as a discipline only towards the latter third of the 19th century. And it arose because of the collapse of this settlement in a certain way. And all of the debates amongst the, the big psychologists towards the latter quarter of the 19th century were, in a sense, about the status of the transcendental subject, whether, in fact, it could be measured, as people like Fechner and the psychophysicists argued. Um, so, um, in a sense, the, the, awry, the emergence of psychology was a kind of birth crisis that arose out of the collapse of the previous organon. Okay. And also the crises never stopped. So the psychology was born in a crisis moment, but it's gone through crisis after crisis since its inception. 
So just to look at a few of the sort of more significant crisis documents, there's Vygotsky's The Historical Meaning of the Crisis in Psychology, a methodological investigation. Um, where he argues that there's a kind of arbitrary unity to psychology. Um, it's lacking any kind of unity. You've got three dominant types of psychology. You've got what he calls basic theoretical psychology, which starts from the normal adult human and will explain everything downwards from that starting point. You've got an approach to psychopathology that would include, for example, the Freudian tradition, which starts with, crudely, the mad human and would then explain the normal adult human from the dysfunctions that are, that are made clear in madness. And then you've got the behavioral approach, which starts with the animal and tries to move up from the animal to explain the adult human and the mad human. So you've got three forms in Vygotsky that, that, that are dominant at the time. And he's saying that but it's completely arbitrary and none of them can serve as a unifying factor. They're all independently interesting <coughs> traditions. And Husserl, the, the father of phenomenology, writes a book in 1936, The Crisis in European Sciences and Transcendental Phenomenology. And he argues that a science is in crisis when its task and method become questionable. And he's arguing that the... the, the, the task and method of psychology had become recurrently questionable. And then there's a French historian of biology, Georges Conguiem, who was the PhD supervisor of Michel Foucault. Um, and he wrote an article in 1956 called Qu'est-ce que c'est la, la, la psychologie? And, and, uh, and here he identified a little like Vygotsky, three traditions of psychology, but argued that there was no unity to the discipline. Um, and he was quite critical of psychology. He said, it's a philosophy without rigor, an ethics without exigency, and a medicine without control. Because psychology took the aspects from medicine that medicine couldn't handle, so the most difficult bits, if you like. Uh, 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 and so no wonder it was in a crisis situation. But it also took the aspects of, of ethics and law that were difficult to manage, that were on the edge of law and ethics, um, and it took the aspects of philosophy that were concerned with knowledge. Um, so, so, so it was dealing, if you like, with the, the, the problematic liminal conditions of the three big old faculties. So psychology starts to grow, if you like, on the edges between all of those faculties. It emerges from philosophy. It emerges from medicine. It emerges from law. Uh, and it emerges from theology. So it, it doesn't have its own distinctive, coherent starting point because it's, if you like, it's leaking out of the cracks in the Kantian settlement. It's associated with the, the cracks in it. And then another one which I'd recommend anybody to read is a wonderful thing by von Bertalampfi, 1967, Robots, Men and Minds, Psychology in the Modern World. And it's a devastating critique from a systems theoretical perspective of the psychology of the first half of the 20th century. And his diagnosis is, well, psychology lacks a theory of symbolism. It doesn't have a basic theory of symbolism. And without a theory of symbolism, it's unable to tell the difference between human forms of social order, for example, and animal forms of social order, or, or human cognition and animal cognition. It's unable to sort of uh, operate uh, with, with, with that kind of distinction. So there's a whole bunch of, of, um, of and, th and that's before the so-called crisis in social psychology even starts. So psychology's existence has been one of staggering from crisis to crisis and not managing to resolve those crises and perhaps not surprisingly given the challenge of its subject matter. So, and today, for example, we've got two big crises. But these are just, if you like, they're just the latest crisis. We've got this replication crisis where it turns out that psychology finds it very difficult to actually replicate uh, its findings. Okay, so it's a huge problem, a huge sort of critique of the scientificity of the discipline, which has allowed itself in some sense to be based upon a form of statistical knowledge, hypothesis testing, that's probabilistic 
And so that it really struggles to um, produce replicable results. It's, 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 it's not surprising at all that you would have the replication crisis. And that there's a solution emerging at the moment which is taking the form of an open science movement. So this is the sort of response to that crisis is to pre-publish your hypotheses, for example, so that you're not able to tinker with your data so easily, although, of course. <laughs> and then there's the post-colonial critique of psychology, um, where, whereby it's being observed that, in some respects, the, 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 the dominant model of psychology is based on a very limited, limited sample um, of white, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic subjects. And that it's, com it's more or less entirely ignoring forms of subjectivity from other places, other cultures, other ethnicities, and so on and so forth. So, so, so there's sort of two current um, um, uh, uh, um, critiques. But m my point is that these, you know, these are just business as usual. You know, we shouldn't be at all surprised about this. So we do need to sort of, I think, take a step back as psychologists and say, well, you know, is there any way that we can sort of advance in what we do so that we're, 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 a, li we're a little bit more lucid about how we encounter these kinds of crises and what we do in the face of them? So I'll say just a few more words about, this. first of all, this idea of a psychology of a second order. So I advocate that what we should do as psychologists is not just do studies of people um, um, and, you know, and particularly studies of people in laboratory conditions whereby we imagine that we can... I, I, this isn't a critique in principle of laboratory experimentations. I'm saying we need to supplement that with other approaches, but we also need to observe the effects of the psychological knowledge that we introduce into the world. Because the knowledge that we introduce into the world shapes the subjectivities of the population that is exposed to that knowledge. So we, we, when, when we introduce categories like, for example, ADHD, which is a very nice category, uh, um, but we should also be very clearly aware of how it's the looping effects of that category change what we are as subjects. We start to think of ourselves as, ah, yeah, I've got ADHD. That means I should do this rather than that. That means I need to sort of, in a sense, become a little bit politically active around this identity of ADHD and make sure that people recognize that I'm ADHD. And all of a sudden, the social life of a large group of people starts to be organized around psychological categories. So as psychologists, we need not just to if you like, do the work which says, oh, there is this thing, ADHD. We need to be aware of what the implications of that are. We need to be able to observe the activities of the discipline. Uh, and that means also taking a historical um, vantage point. But the origins of this idea of a psychology of second order, I, I, the, I, I, I got the idea of it from, from Heinz von Forrester, or at least the one aspect of it, who, who is a cybernetician and who came up with this idea of a cybernetics of cybernetics, a second order observer. So he, he for, for example, noticed that you're trying to build little robots as a cybernetician, right? And the first thing you need to recognize, he said, is that what you want to do is you want to recognize that this thing that you're trying to build needs itself to observe the environment around it. So you as a, cyber, as, as a robot builder need to be an observer of something that is itself an observer. So we need to make observations of something that is itself in the process of making observations. So this idea of a second order observation becomes um, interesting. But um, it's complicated though by the fact that you could say that classic cognitive psychology does this. So it builds its model of the human psyche on an information processor. So it's a variant of, um, of, of um, cybernetics. Um, but in a sense, what it neglects is the idea that, the, that, that G. H. Mead, I think, was the first to really express clearly as a social psychologist, which is that the very nature of ourselves as human beings is that we recognize ourselves as selves by taking the perspective of somebody else towards ourselves. So we see ourselves as if from the outside, and only when we can see ourselves from the outside can we see that we are a self. 
And of course, that allows us to act in a way that's predictable by people around us. We kind of know, oh, you want me to do this, don't you? How do I know Gabo wants me to do... How did I know he wanted just exactly this talk? <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and therein you see there are also problems with, with, with this idea that we take the perspective of the other to ourselves in order to become a self, which is how do we take the perspective of another to ourselves? In some sense, it's impossible to actually understand what the perspective of another is. And so we make estimates as to what we think other people want us to do. But, but Mead's point is that the human self is itself something that comes into existence through a process he doesn't use the phrase second order observation, but through a process of second order observation. So when we are observing other selves, we're observing something that is not just, if you like, a machine that is programmed to mimic um, observation. So, you know, you can imagine a little robot and you could, you could look at its circuitry, make sure its eyes are working properly and so on, but you're still looking at it as if its observational capacities are, if you like, built into it. And they are, because we built them into it, right? So yes, they are, in the case of that robot, built into it. But what that robot isn't doing is observing the observations of the one observing it and changing itself as a result of those observations, taking those observations into account in order to form itself as a self, which is why I sort of play around with this classic German picture of second-order observations. So... What's the difference between a second order observation of a robot and the second order observation of a, of a human being? So I think this for me is the, the root of where cognitive psychology becomes problematic to the extent that it still clings, if you like, to an analogy of an observing system that is based upon an artifice that is designed to observe but that is not observing in the way that a human is observing. So, um, and a corollary of this is then the, the thing that I mentioned, which is to distinguish between a psychology that, if you like, limits itself to just observing the human being as if it were, a, a, you know, a describable from the outside in laboratory conditions, and recognising instead that there's a second form of psychology that needs to actually move around in society and see how forms of subjectivity are being produced at every surface in society. A legal subjectivity as we encounter law, a, a sexual subjectivity as we encounter our erotic lives, a, 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 a political subjectivity as we become involved in politics. Our subjectivity is, if you like, out there in the real world, connected with the surfaces of the, of the um, society in which we're, we're acting. And so I, I, I make this distinction between a kind of Ahab function, which is from Moby Dick, you know, this idea of Captain Ahab who sees this white whale and wants to hunt down this white whale. Well, in some ways, sort of classical first order psychology is on the hunt for the white whale and wants to capture it and sort of, if you like, then you know, take it to pieces and get the whale blubber and so on and so forth. Whereas then there's the Ishmael function, which is, if you like, to follow the whale. It goes to different places, to follow it around, move to when the whale becomes a little bit political, to when the whale becomes a little bit erotic, to when the whale becomes a little bit, you know, literary, and so on. So, and that takes me in timely fashion, I hope, to this distinction between big P and little p. So when doing the history of psychology, we can sort of one device, one way of, of helping us to do second order psychology is to always remind ourselves of this distinction between big P psychology, which is, if you like, the out there knowledge, and little p psychology, which is the subject matter, so that we can actually look at the relationships between the two of them. And so, as a quick summary, we can say the little p psychology is the thing that produces the big P psychology. So we're psychologists, we engage in observations, we conduct experiments. The behavior of doing experiments is part of the subject matter of psychology. We do psychology thanks to little p in, 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 in a certain respect. But also, as I've already mentioned with the example of ADHD, but there are lots of other examples, the big P, 
also produces the little p. So psychology, in a sense, produces its own subject matter. Um, and that's because psychological ideas, concepts, and language affect the thinking and the behavior of those who interact with them. And also, we tend to take our psychological language from the physical world. So, and it's not surprising we take our psychological language from the physical world, because actually it's quite hard to describe the, if you like, space-free world of the psyche. How, how do we explain this, this inner world apart from by drawing analogies from the outer world? So our concepts like emotion, for example. Emotion only came into the English language about the beginning of the 19th century. It didn't exist before that, and it meant it was it was it was it, it meant moving outwards. So you would talk about if clouds are moving across the sky, those clouds are emotional. They're moving across the sky, and we use it as a metaphor to understand our our, our, our psychic life. Um, and also, you know, usually we we criticise people for being anthropomorphic, okay, if we're projecting human qualities onto animals, and that's very unscientific because we should be recognizing that, no, that, that dog is not happy to see us. That dog is wagging its tail, and any happiness is our projection onto that dog, okay? But actually, before we can Anthropom before we can anthropomorphize an animal, we have to know what are the human qualities, and we've taken those qualities from the outside world. We've taken them from animals, for example. We ape people. We're proud like peacocks. You know, they're, 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 our, our vocabulary for describing our emotional lives is drawn from the outside physical world, and especially from animals. So this principle, if you like, which, which Graham Richards calls a physiomorphic principle. So there's anthropomorphism and there's physiomorphism. But physiomorphism is prior to anthropomorphism. So we draw our psychological vocabulary anyway from the external. So that's another sort of implication of it. And the big P psychological study of a phenomenon is also part of that phenomenon and participates in transforming it. So for example, when psychologists became interested in colour perception in the, in the early 20th century, it was because they were interested in the fact that, for example, colourblind people can't see traffic lights. So you, have to, you want to avoid the accidents that are going on because of colour blindness. And you want to work out a way of making traffic lights work also for colour blind people. For example, putting the red light always at the top and the green light at the bottom, so there's more information. Now, in that sense, the psychology of perception is amplifying our, capaci our capacity to perceive in a world that is now organized for cars, right? And so it's contributing to perception. And in the same way, um, you know, um, when aeroplanes started speeding people up and they lost their capacity to judge distances, so that's when perceptual psychologists could come in and start to say, well, how can we help um, pilots to, to, to judge distance under these conditions. And that um, you know, becomes a big tradition of, of psychology of perception. Or educational psychology. When you have the invention of universal education towards the end of the 19th century, new conditions for teaching children, you get the development of developmental psychology. You need to know, well, at what age should we put these children in these different groups? We need some knowledge that we don't have. So educational psychology is part of the process of developing children, just as perception is part of the, perceptual psychology is part of the process. But again, you could say, but this is typical of any science. Uh, a geologist will map a coal field to extract the coal, so the, so the geological knowledge is transforming the bit of the earth that you want to get the coal out of. But it's doing it in a different way to psychology, because you don't expect the coal to respond to the geological knowledge. You just know where it is and dig it out. You don't expect the coal to change as a result of the geological knowledge. It's a completely different scenario. Um, three more. Big P psychology instantiates its own subject matter. So what I mean by that is a psychological text, for example, William James's Principles of Psychology, or pick any contemporary 
example of a, of a psychology text. Um, it's not just about psychology, the subject matter, but it expresses the psychology of the author. So it's very easy to see that, you know, Watson could not have written Principles of Psychology and James could not have written um, the, the early texts on behaviorism. They are expressions of utterly different psychologies. And when you add in cultural differences, like look at the Gestalt psychologists compared to the US psychometricians, for example, they're utterly different psychologies producing an utterly different kind of psychology. The German Gestalt psychologists were, you know, hobnobbing with Einstein and very sophisticated art theorists, for example. They're completely different from Watson, who was kind of, you know, from the you know, the, the, the southern states in, in, in the US and, and was, was not in that kind of cultural context at all. Um, and also research on a psychological phenomenon can instantiate that phenomena. So for example, we might come up with a concept like um, an attribution error, but we could be making that attribution error in our psychology. And I'll give one more example. Um, but what, what I want to argue is, this, this last one, I suppose, is the, is the crucial one. Psychology, we might consider this reflexivity a problem for psychology, something we want to sort of eliminate by an open science approach. You know, if we, if we just are sufficiently kind of lucid about what we're going to do and how we're going to approach it, we can cut out all this reflexivity stuff. We, we, can, we can overcome it. But actually... Maybe what it is for psychology to live is for psychology to recognize that it is influencing subjectivity in this way and that it's coming from subjectivity in this way. And so in some respects, the, 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 what we should do as psychologists is encourage that reflexivity and build it into our practice in this, in this way that I'm suggesting, suggesting with uh, second order psychology. Okay, I've probably um, spoken way too long already, so I, I, I think I'll draw to, to a conclusion there um, uh, it, uh, and, and, and open, if, 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 if any of you have got any questions, um, please fee, feel free to, to ask them. Ghostly silence. Well, we are waiting for the conference. The conclusion? Yeah, the conclusion. Yes. <laughs> so can, should it be reborn or not? <laughs> Well, <laughs> there was more. <laughs> yeah, I think that to the extent that psychology continues to neglect the centrality of subjectivity to its subject matter, it will remain something that is closer to dead <laughs> than to living. It will spread, but it will spread in a sort of automatic way, like a virus spreads in an automatic way. So a virus, maybe there is a small amount of subjectivity in a virus, maybe a tiny amount of subjectivity in a, violence, in a virus, but negligible, right? No, nobody is going to trouble themselves to study it. The question is, how do we sort of raise our consciousness as far above the level of a virus as we can. And there, I think, for example, one of the thing, the two most, I think, interesting chapters in that book are the chapter on race and the chapter on gender, because those are very politically controversial subjects in psychology. And they're subjects when you, where you really see, I'll just show you the last slide, You really see a sort of first phase with the 19th century roots of psychology where essentially um, what happens is psychology just reinforces the status quo of the dominant order. So it would basically give biological rationales for why it is that women are and should be in the home. It's assumed that women are different creatures to men, that that is informed by their very biology. And likewise with the doctrines of scientific racism. Why should we not give um, North American, indigenous North American Indians any land rights? Well, because they are mobile, says John Locke, and, and hence they don't have human rights, and therefore we don't have to consider themselves even 
full humans. And so you have these sort of peculiar and pernicious sort of hierarchies, racialized hierarchies, where if you like the speaking position of the white Western psychologist is completely taken for granted and the perspectives of all other races are then sort of laid out beneath. And that is given a sort of biological justification. So there's a first phase in which in which the social order is defined biologically by psychology. And then there's a second reflexive phase where that gets re-evaluated. And here you get the value of psychology wanting to be empirical. Because, for example, in the 1930s, race psychologists actually started doing empirical studies and realizing that they weren't finding the race differences, so-called race differences that they thought that they would find, that they just weren't there. And then, as a result of that, psychologists began inventing another concept, racism. So racism was a concept actually coined by psychologists. So it's, and it was coined in the 1930s and 1940s, and if you like, the, the, the location of the problem was changed. All of a sudden now, the problem isn't the, 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 race, the race differences. The problem is the people who are racist and are not recognizing that actually there's no such thing as race determining psychological qualities. We're unable to, we're unable to find that um, determination. And then you get a third reflexive phase where, if you like, that psychologization of race through racism gets sociologized and people start saying, well, actually, you know, is this just a matter of a psychological thing or is this to do with power relations? Is, this to do, is, is the fact that the first phase happened to do with the structures of power within society? And so psychology kind of makes itself a little bit redundant, but not completely redundant. It becomes reflexively aware of its own, if you like, involvement in history. And you could say exactly the same story happens with gender, at first a, a biological assumption of gender differences, then you get, in, in fact, we talk about gender differences, the concept of gender is even later than the concept of racism, so gender only arises as a, as a concept within psychology again in the 1930s and 40s, and is then picked up by feminist psychologists in the, in the 1960s as a way of saying, well, yes, there may be some biological differences, but they don't determine the place of women in the society, and so the concept of gender then starts to function in this, in this psychological way. So that would be, for me, an example of, of how, you know, psychology went through an internal transformation, became reflexively aware of its own limits, of its own implications in power relations, for example, um, and, you know, can learn from its experience, can become a second-order observer, <laughs> and can, as a result, produce, hopefully, better psychology. That, that would be my conf conclusion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, could it be that we are doing this kind of psychology because it's actually useful for, I suppose, decision makers or, I don't know, ruling classes, I don't want to use this word. Uh, and in this way, maybe subjectivity doesn't really matter because it's not the individuals that are government, it's groups which we can describe statistically. Yes, I think that that, that, is, that is accurate. Yeah, and, and that, in a sense, that is the diagnosis that Kongiem makes of the discipline uh, in his article in the, in the 50s. And, 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 you know, he's, he's, he's concerned that, 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 in a sense, psychology become, he uses this very nice phrase, psychology is the instrument for the instrumentalization of people. So this is where it takes over the sort of governance capacity that um, Kant is sort of showing in his, you know, organon. So where, it, you know, uh, governance requires a degree of instrumentalization, there the psychologist is called in. So you see that very much in the history of problematic conduct in schools or problematic um, sexual behavior or forms of madness um, and, and, and so on. So the, 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 the sort of attracting foci for psychologists are those areas that need to be mopped up, dealt with, right? So, and, and the problem is then 
Kongiem would say, well, you know, other sciences define their own research agendas, right? If you're a physicist, although of course that changes with the hydrogen bomb, everything changes with the, with the hydrogen bomb, but nevertheless, nevertheless, the, the physicist has a sort of clear calling as to what questions they're going to be asked. Whereas Kongiem points to psychology and says, but you know, you are giving up the question of setting your own agenda and you're just being, if you like, the instrument for the instrumentalization of, of people. So that, that's, I mean, he's got the, he ends the, the, his, his critique with this, I, th I think, quite chilling sort of, he talks about, oh, he, he worked in the Sorbonne and he says there's, there's two ways you can go when you leave the Sorbonne. You can go up the hill towards the Pantheon where the greatness is, or you can go down the hill towards the police station. <laughs> and it's clear what he was saying, uh, and clear what I mean, his student Michel Foucault would read that and think, okay, we can, we can see discipline and punish <laughs> arising from that insight. So yes, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And is this like, unavoidable? Is this what we are going to do in a way forever? No. That's why I think, how do we not stay on that hamster wheel? <laughs> I mean, uh, I wanted to ask whether this is like, inevitable. I suppose you asked it, so I'm just anxious. <laughs> yeah, no, I would say it's not, it's not inevitable. Um, it, it, it's likely. <laughs> it's likely, but it's not inevitable. Um, and, and part of what we do when we launch our critiques of psychology, we're not doing it to destroy psychology. You know, well, I, I'm a psychologist. I like psychology. I want to encourage people to do psychology. Psychology is a very good thing. But it is prone to, you know, large-scale historical misuse, right? And, and we cannot ignore that um, as psychologists and carry on as if, as if, it hasn't happened. We have to have a way of incorporating that into what it is that we're doing and making it inform our practice. So it's difficult, but I think you have to try. No? Uh, you mentioned open science, and what is your take on this? Uh, is it going to just perpetuate the problems that we have and contribute to the cycle by placing these constraints by positivism, or, or can, it, can we somehow use it to more reflexive? I think we can use it to be more reflexive and I, th I think it's very valuable. I, I, I think, I think, it, it, I think it's, it can be very important to reflect on what's at play in open science and I think there's a lot of very productive meanings of openness. I think the idea of sort of the impulse to share your knowledge widely and to be explicit about what you're doing is a, is a positive and strong impulse. But I think there's also, there's also, you know, some troublesome aspects of it, which is, I think that, you know, I, th I think you as a group are already thinking about how it might apply to qualitative research, for example. And there are registrations for qualitative research. Now. That's, that's right. But it seems to me that the, 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 the structure of it is more suited to quantitative studies. And... Um, but the bigger danger is that it sort of perpetuates the idea that the very methodology is not problematic. Now, you know, you can overstate this because, you know, things like ANOVA and factor analysis are really useful tools and can be really useful. But we shouldn't forget the fact that who invented ANOVA? Well, Fisher, right? What, who was Fisher? He was a geneticist who studied peas in agriculture but also he was very active as a eugenicist so he founded the society for eugenics so his real interest was in making sure that people low down on the social structure don't get to reproduce and spread their problematic genes you know so, so, and that works if you're talking about peas right peas yes genetic determination of peas you can manipulate them you produce better peas it's you know, great. Although even there, as we know, GMOs can 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 bring problems. But our one of our two primary methods in psychology, 
has a, a slightly shady heritage which does not account for subjectivity. A, su a P has no subjectivity. You can use ANOVA perfectly adequately with it. There's nothing in the me mechanics of analysis of variance that requires subjectivity. In fact, it encourages you to ignore subjectivity and to operate despite subjectivity. Factor analysis? Who invented that? Francis Galton. Darwin's cousin, preoccupied with his own genetic lineage, writes a book on genius, sees himself as a long line of geniuses, invents genet uh, eugenics. He's the founder of the British Eugenics um, Society. Now, you, you can overstate eugenics as a, as a problem, you know. I think there are some aspects of it that are, that are you know, maybe overplayed, but we can't ignore the fact that um, the two dominant techniques in the armory of modern psychology have roots directly in the founders of eugenics and they are ways of eliminating subjectivity from the relevance of psychological studies. Um, you know, and, and, and what is factor analysis? It's a way of dealing with dirty data, right? You use factor analysis when you realize that your measures aren't actually measuring what you think they're measuring, or you don't know what they're measuring. So you do a bunch of measures and you run a factor analysis and you say, oh, that's what it's measuring, is it? Okay, so it, it, it's precisely a way of, why are our measures so dirty in psychology? Well, is it because of subjectivity? Is it because when people are responding to the scales, they're actually, there's a, you know, so, so you know, that, I think that, that point about open science is that, is that it doesn't ask those difficult questions about, it just says, how do we stop people from manipulating their data to get significant results from, you know, or, or even making up their data. I mean, lots of scandals in psychology recently where, where especially in social psychology, where people were just simply making up their data. Why? Because, of course, now people are doing uh, this career progression is much more important than science. If, if, if you could use the latest techniques to progress your career, and if you fake your data, you can, you can produce your... your, your... Which brings me full circle to Beryl Kurt. <laughs> so the other founder, a big psychometrics inventor of, of, of uh, factor analysis, was Cyril Burt, who also faked his data in the 1930s after receiving a, a, a knighthood. So he's Sir Cyril Burke for his contributions to um, educational psychology. And so Cyril Burke, when asked, so show us your data, because we think you faked it, said, oh, I had, a, I had an assistant. Uh, the, the assistant has the data. Where is this assistant? And, and the assistant couldn't be found, and after maybe a year or two of looking, it was given up, and people and people thought, okay, so maybe there was no assistant, but the assistant was uh, Barrel Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and the other solution that you mentioned, or the other approach, was the decolonial perspective. Yes. Or the decolonial approach. It. She's, and maybe this is a solution because this, those decolonial perspectives in psychology dismantle the power structures that define and reify subjectivity. Right? Yes. And, but is it successful because there might be resistance from those former colonial powers? <laughs> so how does it work actually? Because I participated recently in a special issue about the colonial perspectives mm. in social psychology and it was very diverse. And, mm. But most of authors came from, uh, you know, Asia or Africa or mm. those global south. Yeah, I think, I think, I think w what I find interesting about juxtaposing those two crises and the solutions offered to them is you get, if you like, two different variants of openness. So the openness of open science is kind of one thing. Um, the, openness, the openness that's advocated by um, post-colonial theory is a, is a very different sort of take on openness. And there I think, um, I, you know, I, I, have a lot of, I have a lot of sympathy with the idea that if you change the constituency of people doing psychology, you change the psychology. This goes with the big P, little P thing. And indeed, that's 
what happened in psychology of race and gender in the history of psychology. As women started entering the discipline in, in the 50s and 60s in particular, uh, uh, um, well, so women started looking at the research that was done on the women question and thinking, oh, hold on a minute, this is, this is slightly problematic. This is coming from a male psychology. And, and so, if you like, one of, the, one of the huge factors in changing psychology and making it more reflexively aware is the introduction into it of a new constituency, that, in this case women, and the same with, with, uh, with, with, with uh, racism. A lot of the psychologists critiquing the scientific racism were, 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 were you know, black psychologists, Asian psychologists who were, who were you know, getting involved in the research in the 1930s and 1940s, for example, and still very much now uh, a strong tradition. And so, and so, in a sense, there's... You know, I think there's something very interesting about this this idea that you know, yeah, psychology needs to also consider itself almost like democratic in terms of representing <laughs> different constituencies. But of course, there are also limits to uh, you know to that. It becomes all the more difficult to do psychology. What then becomes the sort of standard psychology? How do the journal articles cope with it? How does the reviewing process cope with it? All of these things are thrown into a crisis by both sort of responses to... to and it also undermines the very functioning of the institutions that, cause, that created psychology you know, and puts them into question, all those professional organizations that need to be Yes, and they're all now sort of having to deal with both of these issues and, and struggling under the weight of it. And, and, and uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, thank you.